This is a picture test in practical neuroanatomy. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then, replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the spinal cord. Name the structure picked up by the forceps. What is its distal attachment? This is the phylum terminale, shown in the dissection of the lower end of the spinal cord. Note that the cylindrical spinal cord tapers at its lower end to form the conus medullaris, and below the level of the intervertebral disc between L1 and L2 in the adult, the tip of the conus medullaris continues as a connective tissue filament covered by pia mater and constitute the phylum terminale. So connective tissue covered by pia from the phylum terminale and lies in the middle of the coda equina. And as you can see it here, it can be easily distinguished by a distinctive bluish coloration. If, if you compare the color, color of the phylum terminale with the color of the surrounding nerve roots. Phylum terminale is a vestige of the spinal cord of the embryonic tail and it uh, picks up a dural investment opposite the second sacral segment uh, at the second sacral segment subarachnoid space um, ends so there's no more lumbar cistern and so the dura mater is covering the phylum terminale and the resulting structure is called the coccygeal ligament the coccygeal ligament extends from the level of S2 and is attached to the dorsum of the coccyx. Which of the tracts 1 to 4 is crossed at this level? First, let's identify the tracts. One is located in the dorsal half of the lateral funiculus. It is the lateral corticospinal tract. The tract consists of 75 to 90 percent of pyramidal tract fibers that cross at the pyramidal decussation in the medulla. So this is across the tract. At this location it is across the tract. The small amount of fibers that do not cross at the pyramidal decussation, the 25 to 10 percent of fibers, they form the ventral corticospinal tract, which is in four. Two is the dorsal funiculus and it contains fibers of ipsilateral first order neurons located in dorsal root ganglion. Three is located at the periphery of the posterior aspect of the lateral funiculus and it is the posterior spinocerebellar tract or dorsal spinocerebellar tract. Cell bodies are located in the ipsilateral Clark's column. So the only cross the tract here is one, the lateral corticospinal tract. It should be remembered that the fibers of four the ventral corticospinal tract will eventually cross at segmental levels by traversing the anterior white commissure to synapse with contralateral anterior horn cells. Thus, the whole pyramidal pathway is crossed, but here the fibers in four are not crossed. Fibers in two in the dorsal funiculus, they form the dorsal column medial lemniscus system, which is again as a system or a pathway, it's a crossed pathway, but the crossing involves axons of second order neurons, not the first order neurons which are present here in two. Second order, uh, axons of second order neurons are located in the medulla and they decussate and form the medial lemniscus in the medulla oblongata, not at this level. The dorsal spinocerebellar tract is uncrossed and will remain uncrossed until it ends in the cerebellum by passing through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Match the result of damage to each of the numbered regions. First, ipsilateral loss of vibratory sense. Second, contralateral loss of pain and temperature. And three, Horner's syndrome. It looks like the section is representing an upper thoracic segment. Note the presence of intermediolateral cell column, B, the beginning of accumulation of fasciculus cuneatus, 
which is just located lateral to fasciculus gracilis. Gracilis is the medial part of the dorsal funiculus, and the cuneatus is located a little bit lateral to it. C represents the anterior and lateral spinothalamic tract, the ventrolateral system. Now returning back to the damage, ipsilateral loss of vibratory sense would result from a lesion in the fasciculus gracilis, which transmits modalities of sensation, uh, of vibration, proprioception, and discriminative touch. Contralateral loss of pain and temperature result from a lesion of C, the lateral spinothalamic tract. Fibers of the lateral spinothalamic tract, they originate in the contralateral nucleus proprius, and they cross through the anterior white commissure to ascend in this tract. So damage to the tract will result in contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation. B is the intermediolateral cell column, which consists of sympathetic preganglionic motor neurons. The axons, they exit with the ventral root of the spinal nerve, and then they enter the sympathetic chain of ganglia via the white ramus communicans as preganglionic fibers. Now in the upper, in the upper four thoracic segments, some fibers of the preganglionic sympathetic fibers, as they reach the sympathetic trunk, they ascend to the superior cervical ganglion. And then they relay in the superior cervical ganglion where postganglionic sympathetic fibers from the superior cervical ganglion, they accompany the internal carotid artery to supply structures in the head. They supply the skin as elsewhere in the body with vasomotor, pilomotor, and pseudomotor fibers. And in the head, the sympathetic fibers also supply the dilator pupillae muscle and the smooth muscle part of levator palpebri superioris. Now, Horner syndrome results from damage of sympathetic innervation in the head and is characterized by flushing and dryness of the skin together with pupillary constriction and ptosis. All these effects are the opposite of the sympathetic activity. So flushing is opposite to vasoconstriction, dryness is opposite to pseudomotion, and pupillary constriction is, is opposite to the action of the dilator pupillae. Ptosis is because of the paralysis of smooth muscle part of levator palpebri superioris. Now since B, the lateral horn, is a source of sympathetic innervation in the head, then Horner syndrome could result from damage of the lateral horn. This doesn't mean that all Horner syndrome results from this damage, from damage of the lateral horn. Horner syndrome could result from damage of the sympathetic trunk itself and the postganglionic fibers. But in this case, it results from damage of the preganglionic fibers and the neurons that, that supply these fibers. Identify the structure A, how many pairs of structure B are attached to the spinal cord. This is a dissection of the spinal cord showing the outer thick covering of dura mater A. The arachnoid is directly applied to its inner side as a shiny lining, as you can see it here. Pia surrounds the cord and its extensions form the thin denticulate ligament. B is a spinal nerve root. There are anterior and posterior roots that unite to form a spinal nerve. Note here that there is an anterior spinal artery, a single trunk that descends in the front of the cord extending to its uh, lowest part and continues as a slender twig on the phylum terminale. Now we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Each is formed by the union of an anterior root B and a posterior root. So 31 pairs of spinal nerves, 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and 1 coccygeal. What is the clinical term used to describe a lesion affecting area A? What is the origin of vessel B? A is the anterior horn, containing anterior horn cells, also called alpha motor neurons, or ventral horn, 
motor neurons. In the lumbosacral region, which is shown in this section, the large alpha motor neurons are aggregated into medial and lateral nuclear groups. The large number of ventral horn motor neurons in the cervical and lumbosacral enlargement reflect the extensive motor innervation required to supply the limbs. Now, fibers of corticospinal tracts, upper motor neurons, synapse with these neurons, with the alpha motor neurons of the anterior horn cells. That's why these cells are called lower motor neurons. And they are the origin of motor fibers that pass through the anterior root of spinal nerve. A lesion affecting these cells in A, like in case of, for example, poliomyelitis, would result in flaccid paralysis. The paralysis will be ipsilateral to the lesion and only at the level affected by the lesion. Now, since we are talking about lumbosacral region here, then it affects the lower limb. There will be diminished or absent tendon reflexes, progressive atrophy of the muscles deprived from motor fibers, as well as, as I mentioned, the flaccid paralysis. B is the anterior spinal artery. You can see its proximity to the anterior median fissure of the spinal cord. You may also notice a vein and some radicular vessels accompanying the anterior rootlets of spinal nerves. The anterior spinal artery arises bilaterally as two small branches near the termination of the vertebral arteries at the caudal pons. The two branches that constitute the anterior spinal artery descend in front of the medulla oblongata and unite at the level of foramen magnum. The anterior spinal artery is not the sole artery that supplies the spinal cord. There are also two posterior spinal arteries. Each is a branch of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. The spinal arteries, whether anterior or posterior, they extend the length of the cord, but they are small vessels, and most of their blood comes from reinforcement by anterior and posterior radicular arteries. These radicular arteries, they arise from segmental arteries, for example, posterior intercostal arteries in the thoracic region, vertebral artery in the um, cervical region, and these radicular branches, they gain access to the spinal cord by passing through intervertebral foramina. Identify the tract. What is the origin of its fibers? What type of information is transmitted by its fibers? The tract is located between the peripheral margin of the cord and the tip of the dorsal horn. It is the dorsolateral tract of Lisauer. Unmyelinated or lightly myelinated accents of the lateral division of the dorsal root. This is the dorsal root ganglion containing pseudo-unipolar neurons. Fibers enter through the posterior root, lateral division of the posterior root. Uh, they will ascend and descend within the dorsolateral tract for two or three segments above and below the level as they enter the cord. And then the fibers will uh, synapse on neurons of the dorsal horn. They transmit pain and temperature sensations. Second order neurons in this pathway, they originate in the cells and the nucleus proprius, and the axons will form the contralateral spinothalamic tract. In brown sequart syndrome, where there is a hemisection of the spinal cord, the lesion involving the lateral spinothalamic tract thus results in contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation, not immediately below the level of the hemisection, but two to three segments further below. Because at the level of the section, the fibers that formed the spinothalamic tract have ascended in the contralateral dorsal lateral tract of Lisauer from two to three segments below before synapsing on the tract cells that cross and form the spinothalamic tract.
so they are safe. Pain, loss of pain and temperature sensation starts at two to three segments below the level of the lesion.